what does addiction mean to you? Because I think that's really in some ways the, the crux of the problem around this stuff is definitions. What does it mean to be addicted to a substance, to a drug? Yeah. So, I mean, the typical distinction, and it's sometimes a little bit vague the way the two words are used, but dependence is where you use a drug habitually, but the social and professional repercussions of that dependence are non-destructive or potentially even constructive. So okay. somebody with ADHD could be dependent on Ritalin or Adderall right. and their social professional functioning could actually be improved as a result of daily use of that psychoactive drug. Mm -hmm. It becomes addiction when that dependence is instead of constructive or neutral, it becomes problematic and destructive. Okay. That's, I've always liked that. I mean, I'm a recovering alcoholic. I mean, that's what I'm called, but, um, and someone said to me once, well, it's a, you have a drinking problem if drinking is a problem. Right. Yeah. If it's not a problem, keep drinking, <laughs> you know, I mean, don't, don't change anything. Right. The, um, do you think that I know you have a lot to say on this, but I'm just asking for the audience. Do you think that addiction is, um, physical, a physical phenomenon, people are, that are physic. do you think people are physically addicted to drugs? There's definitely physical, non-psychological components to addiction. And again, addiction is very complicated, obviously, and, and it's different for different people and different substances, but some things that come to mind, there are potential genetic determinants. It might be the case, for example, that somebody who is predisposed to not not suffer severe hangovers is also predisposed to alcoholism because they don't experience the same punishing effect of overindulgence that somebody who has severe hangovers would. Um, mm -hmm. There are also, you know, it's associated with depression, it's associated with anxiety, it's associated with an, a number of other, uh, those are psychological factors, of course, but you could also, um, you could probably find any number of, uh, physical characteristics that might predispose someone to this or that addiction or dependence. Um, but this is then connected to a almost infinitely complex number of uh, developmental, social, professional factors that make it really hard to understand. And I, I'm going through a very uh, difficult time right now because a close friend of mine recently died Oh. And, um, he was, and, and his death was a very stark confrontation with how hard it is to understand addiction. Like I, I did not know what was happening to him. I knew something was wrong. That was very much clear to me. Something was definitely wrong with him, but he wasn't telling me what was wrong with him. And so there's this idea that addiction is it's like the way it's depicted in new Jack city or the basketball diaries right. or requiem for a dream or permanent right. midnight or whatever, where someone's shirtless shaking saying like, right. I just need my fix. I need my fix. But often the reality is you don't actually know what's going on. You know, something is wrong. You know, somebody is dysfunctional, you know, something is up, but unless you're a mind reader or collecting blood samples periodically, it can be very, very difficult to know what is happening, especially if somebody is being dishonest. And one phenomenon that I've observed um, that I don't think is often described very often in addiction literature is that often people who are, and this is just from my personal experience, I don't know if this has ever been studied, but this is something that I have observed. People who are addicted often create a false problem that they use to explain their addiction. Yep. So I was friends with somebody who was a heroin addict, but he also claimed to have a very rare tropical disease. And the rare tropical disease could be used as an explanation for any social or professional dysfunction. Mm -hmm. If he was tired all day, that was the tropical disease acting up. This was a disease that no one knew very much about. You could Google it. There's a Wikipedia entry, but it was almost like a, a blank slate that he could use to explain any bad behavior. I had uh, my friend that died told me that he was an alcoholic. 
I never saw him drink excessively. And I always thought his description of his own alcoholism uh, was kind of puzzling to me um, because I've known people who are severely alcoholic and he didn't behave like any alcoholic I've ever met. But again, who am I to say what an alcoholic behaves like because of the tremendous diversity in human behavior? It's very hard to say anything. You know, I, and I say this as someone who, you know, you can look on Reddit right now and there will be threads about how I'm a heroin addict and you can tell because I look tired in this interview in episode two of season three or whatever. And, you know, these people seem to feel very comfortable uh, making what is a completely false assessment of what uh, realistically, I was almost certainly tired from traveling continuously and not sleeping, uh, which is, you know, the real thing that I was up against most of the time that I was doing this stuff. So, mm. So I was, you know, kind of in this state of uncertainty, knowing something was wrong, knowing that he was telling me that he was an alcoholic, knowing that it didn't quite make sense, but I couldn't figure it out otherwise. And what was really happening is that he had become very, very severely dependent and addicted to dissociative anesthetics. Oh. And, um, but he never said that to me. And occasionally I bring it up and say, are you, are you taking ketamine what's going on are you high right now and then he'd say no no i'm not high i'd say like well i almost hope that you are high because if you're not high right now there's something very severely wrong with you cognitively yeah. and like you need some help you need to uh see somebody about this and he'd say no i'm fine i'm fine and then it can have this sort of reverse gaslighting effect where you start to wonder well am i I the crazy one for even am I being an asshole because I'm uh, suggesting that there's some dysfunction at play here? Maybe I'm just being overly critical. Maybe he is fine what he says. And um, and and so that was yeah this whole experience, which was a sort of multi-year unfolding with a very close friend of mine, was a uh, very dramatic confrontation with how complicated it is to recognize and assess addiction. And then when it comes to why was he addicted? Was it because he was depressed? Was it because he was anxious? Was it because he suffered some form of childhood trauma? Um, he didn't say. So it's, again, it involves this sort of endless speculation for a behavior that was ultimately mysterious to me other than and most of what I did. I didn't learn until after he died when people contacted me and would say, Oh, well, you know, you should probably know that uh, two months ago, he texted me and said that he needed help getting ketamine because it was the only way that he could feel normal or whatever. And, and so, you know, a lot of what I learned, I didn't know at the time, because he was strategically hiding any information from me that would have allowed me to understand the severity of his problem. What do you, why do you think he hid it, hid it? And why do you think people do that? Well, one very obvious reason is because he didn't want to stop and he knew that I was disapproving because I had been aware that he used dissociatives and I was also aware that when he used them, the results were very negative. He would say that they were the only antidepressant that worked and he just needed to find a, a therapist who understood that ketamine was the only antidepressant that could really help him and then say, you know, I know that's how you feel, but I honestly think that that's the last thing that you need is somebody who's going to give you additional medical justification for what you're doing, because I'm watching what happens to you when you take these things. And the results appear very negative to me. You're experiencing severe cognitive dysfunction. You're acting in a socially disruptive and strange way. It's making you delusional. And this was years ago that I was having these conversations. And then he recognized that I was critical of his use and that if he said, Hey, I'm getting high on ketamine and say, don't do that. I, you know, we've talked about this. This is not a good strategy for you. You should try to find a more constructive way of dealing with whatever it is you're dealing with, because this is not going to be sustainable. And, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I've seen it, you know, personally on a number of occasions and, um, it's very hard to help people who aren't honest because they know that they'll be judged because they know that, um, 
that not only will they be judged, they know that implicit within that judgment will be pressure to change their behavior, behavior that they don't want to change. 